I've been a critic of the Molchami cards ever since Perulia was revealed in the OCG. I was under the assumption it would be the first in a series of new hand traps, and we've been introduced to the second of such in Fuoros, but it remains to be seen if we'll receive more than that. In any case, I decided to make a video explaining why I think these cards are poorly designed. It realistically was reiterating points I've discussed elsewhere as concisely as possible. I wrote a script, recorded it, and edited it. It was about a seven minute long video. But due to a conversation sparked by the video Farfa uploaded 17 hours ago at the time of my writing this, I'm remaking the whole thing. The core of this video is the same as I originally intended, but I feel it's necessary to explain why I decided to make it in the first place. Farfa's video titled, Are Combo Decks Bad for Yu-Gi-Oh? happens to be a good jump off point. In that video, he raises two points that led to the aforementioned conversation. First, if you don't like the way the game plays, then it might not be the game for you. Incidentally, I have another video where I talk about this both generally and with regards to Monster Hunter. The main consideration here is to be self-aware. Whether or not we like or dislike something isn't necessarily indicative of if that thing is good or bad, so it's important to examine our reasonings as to why we dislike that thing. If I dislike playing a game, is it because I dislike the mechanics, their execution, or a combination of the two, for example? Or let's say I'm playing a series, and I find the further along I go in the series, the less I enjoy combat. Am I desensitized to it, or could it be that the audio and visual cues have changed enough that the experience was less impactful? Like This is actually something that I think is really easy for us to potentially gloss over, but it has a meaningful impact on how we enjoy that gameplay, right? Overall, if you don't like how a game plays, don't play it, but there is nuance to these things, and that's all I really wanted to add here. The second point he raised was the game has always been this way, and I think it's a somewhat faulty argument with regards to the current state of affairs. As Farfa mentions, we've had combo decks that try to win the game on the spot for most of the game's lifespan, but that doesn't mean they are good for the game. The vast majority of combo decks don't even do things on that level to begin with, so I think it's worthwhile discussing this from a bit of a different vantage. Personally, I think the conversation should be situated more on how the tools that are meant to address combo decks are designed. The Yu-Gi-Oh! community keeps going back to the Nibiru discussion for a reason after all. Some decks have a glaring weakness to the card, and usually when a new theme is revealed, one of the main things we scramble to do is make sure the deck either has a mid combo or one that allows it to do something through being hit by it, if not both. It's effectively a prerequisite for a deck to be considered good enough in the eyes of many, and for some of us, even if we think a strategy is decently strong, Nibiru alone can be the reason we decide not to take it to an event. Which brings us to my thoughts on the Mulchami cards. Now, I think these cards are fundamentally poorly designed, so I'm going to do my best to explain why I think that's the case. I do like the restriction that requires the player to have an empty board to use them. It helps to ward off situations like those presented by Triple Tactics Talent and Triple Tactics Thrust, where the cards on paper seem like very strong going second and grind game tools, but in practice they also have absurdly powerful uses when going first that can potentially lead to non-games. This restriction doesn't have the main underlying issue Max C does, where a player can build a board, possibly while preventing the resolution of their opponent's Max C, then utilizing their own while their opponent attempts to scale the wall they place down in front of them. But this doesn't mean similar situations cannot happen. If the going first player gets their board removed by something like a lightning storm, they could still resolve a Molchami card. On its own, I think this is kind of okay. But let's say you're playing against a deck that has primarily graveyard-based interactions. If you clear your opponent's board, they'd potentially be able to chain either of the Molchami cards at resolution as chain link 1, and follow them up with any floating or graveyard effects. Dialing back for a second, I do want to emphasize this is a somewhat pessimistic view of things, but it is rooted 
in a circumstance I've seen on a somewhat regular basis, both in my own gameplay and many of the OCG and TCG tournament streams I've been watching for the last six or so months. It's been a combination of locals, some of which had over 30 players, regionals, YCSs, and various championship series and cups in OCG regions. That's the part I'm overall positive about. I still did want to give a fair shake to both the upsides and downsides of it, even though that is, again, the part that I think is the best aspect of these cards. The parts I don't think are the most well executed are the other two restrictions. The first is you can only activate one other Moltrumi monster effect the turn you activate this effect. And the second is you must randomly shuffle cards from your hand into the deck. So the number in your hand equals the number your opponent controls plus six. So if your opponent controls one card at the end of their turn, if you have seven or less cards in hand, you keep it. If you have eight or more, you shuffle the excess back. I think both of these restrictions are honestly quite solid on paper. The former limits the number of Molchummy cards we'd want to see and means we cannot keep stacking them. The latter means if we heavily impact our opponent's board, we don't also get to keep a massive hand. However, when we begin to scrutinize them, it's very apparent that two of the same Molchummy card can be activated in one turn. I believe the YCS where Perulia was first legal, this happened in top cut. In a matchup where these cards are good, one player resolving two copies of either can and usually will be very damning for the opponent. I think the first effect really needed, with a different name from this card, tacked on to the middle to curb those types of blowout situations. And this isn't even considering it's entirely possible to draw into a second copy off of the first. And of course, depending on what's going on in your matchup, you just use it immediately. For the second point, the effect is so lenient in practice, the likelihood of the person who activates the Moltrumi card actually needing to shuffle back anything is quite low. If you have no choice but to play into it, Ending on a body, a field spell, and a back row would allow your opponent to keep up to 9 cards in hand and draw one more at the start of their turn. Here the up to is the important bit. In the hypothetical I presented, the player who activated a Mocharmy gets to keep everything as long as their hand does not exceed 9 cards by the end of their opponent's turn. Ergo, that plus 6 limit kind of doesn't matter because they wouldn't be likely to hit it anyway. Because if they're drawing in the hand traps and using their hand traps, their hand size very likely is going to be quite similar to what they started off with. It probably should have just shuffled back if they had more than five cards. And one incidental offset with Max C is it has the flaw of potentially leading to deck out as punishment for the overcommitment of activating multiple copies. Or sometimes you'll just get ratioed because your opponent has the out to you activating a single copy of the thing. Moltrumi cards avoid this punishment inherently. I'm honestly just pointing this out because I saw a deck out attempt fail the other day because of the shuffle back, so make of that what you will. Think of it like this. A game with a good plot and terrible everything else will still be seen as an overall bad game. Acknowledging the good story doesn't change that. These cards are similar. I believe on the whole, when it comes to their practical application, they are poorly designed, but that doesn't mean all the elements of their design are bad. Some people like Perulia because it's more narrow and others like it because it's a dedicated tool against normal summon focused decks. I acknowledge both of these things and generally I welcome tools that are more versatile or cover other bases, but I don't think any of that takes away from how ill-conceived these are with regards to the axis the game sits on. And like, Obviously, the gameplay paradigm these two, Droll and Max C Force, are all abhorrent to deal with. Now, thinking of these cards in terms of how we think of Nibiru, they introduce the exact same type of issue. You now need a way to somewhat reliably offset whichever one of these your deck is weak to, as they end up being somewhat game-determinative cards. It's a band-aid fix that feeds into making our frustrations worse long-term. And 
I think a lot of people do gloss over the fact that Perulia is really, really strong against link strategies. Now, don't get me wrong, Furos is going to be the stronger card in the vast majority of situations, but most link strategies search cards out, add them to hand, and then summon them from hand. The main two exceptions I can think of off the dome currently would be Ogdoatic and Malice. And in the case of Ogdoatic, if you're running a Rika package, you do some amount of hand summoning as well. So it's not the craziest thing, but even that could incidentally end up getting hit by Perulia. So, you know, it's worth considering. It's worth talking about. I honestly watched Farfa's video around two hours after it first had been uploaded. And a lot of what uh, these bozos mentioned were thoughts I had at the time without a cohesive link to bind them together prior to our 2 a.m. conversation. On one hand, the card design arms race we seem to be dealing with has unnecessarily turboed us into a situation where some of the more recent combo decks are wholly overtuned. Extremely thin core packages and the ability to run an absurd amount of non-engine coupled with the fact that people are finally engaging with the idea that running a higher card count doesn't necessarily mean your deck is more inconsistent. Shout out to that one mark the page video, by the way. When it comes to engaging with an opponent's board, we've always had four options at least. Playing a strategy that doesn't really care about their interruptions. I think medicals fall into this category, but trap decks are a huge proponent of this. Whether it's Labyrinth, Eldritch, or Altergeist. Stopping the combo wholesale, which is something we need to deal with Dark World's hand loop foolishness. And the last two would be breaking their board and or playing into it. In comparison to the screenshot I've provided, I've always viewed board breaking as something that is rarely a full measure. You disable and potentially remove components of the opponent's board while attempting to establish something on your own end. There are a number of decks that are more well-suited to simply playing into a board for the same end result. But the recent trend of many inboard bodies being 3,000 or more attack has pushed things to a point where in many cases there is a need to completely clear a board to avoid losing immediately on the crackback. This is also why I keep pointing the Blazar stat line when discussing that card. It's extremely relevant to being able to engage with it. The Lightning and Double were individually extra deck staples for a while because being able to boost your stat line for combat based removal was that important. Like, remember when Diamond Crab was used to out towers because the EU didn't have anything better? In summary, I think the Molchami cards are not that well designed, even though I think elements of their design are good. The way they are structured leads into the exact things we've said multiple times that makes going second so hard, but now it's being applied to the going first player. I'd love to be proven wrong, but I think these are cards we would have been better off without. And I could talk about the game's overall orientation for hours, but I have to, you know, play some bullshit now.